Okay. So, uh, so hi everyone. My name is David Grealish. I'm a computer historian, and uh, this is Stephen. And I don't <laughs> Stephen from Mac eighty four. Do you give out your last name? Sure. My name is Stephen Matarazzo from the Mac eighty four YouTube channel. He's a good personal friend of David at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, I am producing a uh, film called Before Macintosh: The Apple Lisa, and um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. I am going to start off. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and. Um, so here I talk about there's been some delays. So most of the filming of the interviews went on in 2019. And I flew out to Silicon Valley a couple of times, Salt Lake City, Utah, New York City, West Palm Beach, Florida, Panhandle of Florida, um, South Carolina, and interviewed about 14 people, including John Scully, the former CEO and president of Apple Computer, Bill Atkinson, who's a very semi-famous, I guess, you know, engineer from Apple. He went on to work on the Macintosh project. but. Um, so there's been some delays, but it's actually getting finished. I had originally set a date of fall of 2019 as the getting it done, which is way too optimistic. So, um, so first I'm gonna start off and, and let Steven here tell you a little bit about himself. So he is now the associate producer and editor on this project. Cool. Hi, I'm Steven. Uh, so I've had a, always had an interest in computers and electronics and it's just one of those things that came naturally to me. Um, my first real experience was with a Macintosh 2CX when I was young. Uh, my father brought it home, he did graphic design stuff and I was just instantly drawn to it. Um, so nowadays I do uh, YouTube videos. Uh, the name is Mac84 on YouTube. I'm also on Twitter and stuff like that. But uh, I really enjoy keeping these machines alive um, because I grew up with Apple machines. That's what's sort of personally, you know, nostalgic for me and important to me and uh, I've been so excited to meet so many people in this awesome community and collaborate with some of the people here today like Clint and Ken uh, and you know fix up their machines and stuff like that because I, I think it's important that we know the history of these machines it's not forgotten and uh, keep them out of landfills which is very particularly interesting as far as Lisa goes and so uh, I have a bit of a personal history with computers. You know, my, my probably the oldest system I played around with from a young age was an Atari 2600. It's an anniversary gift for my parents. So uh, that was the video game console we grew up with, which was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned the first Mac that we had when I was young. But, um, you know, I, I really, um, you know, drew, got drawn to a lot of electronics and computers. and. Really, uh, my artistic abilities of drawing and playing around with that was sort of enhanced by the computer. I thought that was an excellent tool. And so, you know, in the early 2000s, so I, I started collecting more, started being more interested in like the preservation of things, scanning documents and uploading things and stuff like that. And really, you know, just my, my sort of, hey, I want to like create content type stuff didn't really start until like 2016, 2017. I was always the guy that was afraid to speak. I didn't want to be in front of a crowd, yet here I am today. Um, so that has changed a lot. Um, and I, I think that it's just, you know, I wanted to be a vehicle to share the information, the knowledge I had about these machines. And uh, well, I guess it had to be me. So I had to, you know, toughen up and <laughs> go in front of the, the camera and all that stuff. But uh, I met David and, uh, you know, it's it's been so much fun to take a look at the the footage that he has and the, and the clear passions that he has for this project. And so I'm super excited to be editing this feature. And it's just, I mean, some of the footage that we found, some of the things we found is simply amazing. So uh, we're going to be very excited to share it. And I'm so happy to be a part of this. So thank you, David. Thank you. And Stephen just bought his first Lisa. Yes. Yesterday. <laughs> Here. Yesterday. So he's a bad influence on me already. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a testament, which will, one of the main themes that comes out of this is like someone like himself who, Mac enthusiasts, they really see the Lisa as part of that family. And uh, I'm going to speak a little bit more to that here very shortly. So, all right. So I'm going to try to fly through this a little bit, not drag it out too much. I have a little more going back. So anyway, a little bit about myself and my computer history. Basically, the first computer I ever set my fingers upon was an Apple II in 1982 when I went to college. And so the computer lab there used Apple IIs, and I thought it was pretty cool. The first computer I ever owned was a Commodore 64. I had a very nice girlfriend, sort of late in the run, 86, bought me this for my birthday. All I ever owned was that computer. I had no disk drive, cassette drive, display, anything. I hooked it up to my television, fooled around in basic. I had to leave it on for days. Because if I turned it off, I couldn't save anything. But my first real computer that I consider was my Apple Lisa. And um, so quick story here is I, I, uh, I discovered the Macintosh and also in 1986. As soon as I saw the Macintosh, I was like, this is a computer I want. 
I can't ever see not using using a DOS machine or whatever. I had no hope of affording one. I ended up working for an Apple dealer in 1989 in Gainesville, Florida, where University of Florida is. Even as an employee, I got a discount. The entry level Mac Plus with a 20 meg hard drive was about 1600 bucks, and it might as well have been $10,000 to me in 1989 as a young man. But one day a guy brought one of these in for service. I'm like, what is, what is this thing? It looks like a big Mac. And then, uh, keep the story short, uh, there's a company in Logan, it was in Logan, Utah, where they took the old stock of these, it's in the documentary, and then they would basically upgrade them to a Mac Plus, essentially, and I could buy one for $1,095. I had just that much with shipping on a credit card. And so in December 1989, this became my first Mac. It was running the Mac operating system, had a 12-inch screen, no limitations, other than did not have the sound circuitry of a Macintosh. Tried to run a, a game on it that addressed the sound circuitry, it crashed. But I didn't run games, I learned how to desktop publish on this. So I ran Cork Express on my Lisa. But this started my entire journey into uh, becoming a, uh, basically a Mac guru, if you will, and I, I'm an IT support um, expert. Windows and Mac, but so it, it launched that career for me as well as my interest in computer history. So first the, the history of that, Apple, and then the industry, you know, just grew. So uh, this is the, the little ad where I bought it from Sunry Marketing in late 1989. So see, there it is, at least a 20 megabyte system for 1095, I don't know if you can read it. Not talking the microphone, but that's where I got it. Some of the other uh, influences on me, you know, once I, I got really interested in computer history where this show, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Bits and Bytes, you can look at it on YouTube. Great time capsule, very entertaining, early 80s. But this one's my favorite documentary. So early on, I started loving documentaries. And so that kind of plays a key in this story, right? And if anyone's ever watched this, it's called The Machine That Changed the World. And it's a PBS documentary, 1991. You know, the great thing about history is it's history. So even a 30 year old documentary is still good history, right? As far as I know, there's nothing wrong in this documentary. And uh, so it's one of my favorites. And I just want to show you the intro because I think it's cool. Let's see. If I can find it. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. Where is it? Oh, no, it was the one I, sh I started off with. Duh, it's right here. All right. <laughs> But I was just enthralled with this intro. Tonight, on the machine that changed the world, a world where information flows across oceans and continents, some of it highly personal. You and I are counted and recorded and questioned and dossiered and filed, probably more than any people on Earth. The world at your fingertips. Coming up on the machine that changed the world. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. was also a computer history enthusiast back in the early 90s when, believe me, there weren't this many people interested. Maybe a copy of this on VHS, I watched the mess out of it over the years. All right. These are some of the books that were catalysts to my interest. I recommend all of them. Um, have you ever heard of any of them? Hackers Especially by Stephen Levy. So I just started eating up all this information. I was in the military, by the way, in the Army. 
And so I was, you know, buying these books and reading stuff. But anyway, in 1992, I uh, had an idea. I was in Germany for two years, I returned to the United States. I thought, wouldn't it be kind of interesting to maybe collect computers? Because they're trash to people, right? They throw them away, they give them away. That's me, 1992, still in the Army. So I, I came up with something called the Historical Computer Society. And I started a newsletter. And uh, there I am. Some old computers, see? <laughs> <laughs> Collectibles. So I started, uh, I launched the Historical Computer Society meeting in 1993, 92, and then 93, I published Historically Brewed, a little newsletter. And the name was not a good choice, but it, it, what it was a play on words is people in the very early days of personal computing home brewed their computers. So get it, Historically Brewed? So and it's interesting if you notice the very first article, I wrote this whole thing because it was just me. Later on, I, people submitted articles to me and I you know, put them in the newsletter. Very first article I wrote, the GUI, where did its history really begin? Sound familiar? Because <laughs> I was, you know, Mac head and Lisa's and all that stuff. So August 1993, I ultimately published nine of them over about two years and uh, got about 500 subscribers across the world, even sold in um, the Computer Museum in Boston at the time. It's now in Mountain View, California. So, but then uh, got out of the military, had two children, life got complicated, it kind of stalled. I actually printed these covers in 97 and spent a lot of money on it, never finished it. And, and this hobby of mine kind of stalled out for a long time. But this is essentially this 10th issue, but I had renamed it. I thought this was a better name, Classic Computing. It is a better name. My website's classiccomputing.com. But in November 2011, I finished this issue and I, I did a Kickstarter and I took all nine issues with that issue and my story and I put it into a book. And I, I did a Kickstarter and stuff. Originally it was called The Complete Historically Brewed. Again, not a good name, <laughs> and then I, I redid it, so it's classic computing and complete historically brewed. Anyway, so there's my book. Um, I started getting back into my computer history interests, and I've done a number of podcasts over the years, and uh, the bottom one is still active. I'm not on it, but it's still, I created it, and it's still going strong, 200-something podcasts, or episodes, rather. I tried to do my own, called classic computing. I wasn't very good at it. Um, I'm a writer. I've written plenty of articles, and um, one of them there is, uh, where is it? Oh, is there a Walt Disney Steve Jobs connection at time.com? That's where that picture came from. But classiccomputing.com, I'm proud of some of these articles, and I've interviewed some important people like Ed Roberts, Alan Kay, John Scully, and then some people that ended up in this document, documentary early on, you know, why I interviewed them earlier. So, um, in 20, I think this is 20, 17, 18, but um, I participated in a documentary about the Apple Newton. Anyone an Apple Newton enthusiast? And, um, and my little sh I made a little short, and so I'm gonna show it to you. And this was kind of a, another catalyst that got me into you know, what I'm doing. So I hope you enjoy it. I think you'll learn a lot about computer history in under six minutes. That's my promise to you. It's easy to forget that there were once no personal computers just a little less than two generations ago. The handheld computer and communications device that you probably have with you at all times is also, just barely, a decade or less old itself. The earliest computers were behemoths and more akin to calculators living inside of large government, university, and corporate installations. That first generation of fully electronic computers used vacuum tubes to perform their calculations. They acted as binary switches to represent bits, on or off, or as ones and zeros. Giant vacuum tube-filled computers were soon replaced by computers with transistors inside, thus establishing the second generation of computers. The invention of the transistor had made it possible for smaller and faster computers to be developed, as they were much smaller than tubes, used far less power, and didn't have heat problems. The third generation of computers was defined by the next significant innovation, the integrated circuit. An integrated circuit could replicate hundreds, then thousands, and more of transistors onto one tiny piece of silicon, known as a chip. These chips established what is now generally referred to as the semiconductor industry. Naturally, as this market continued to evolve, computers got even faster, as well as smaller and smaller. 
Where computers were once room-sized, now there were some only about the size of a couple of refrigerators. For around 20 years, the Central Processing Unit, or CPU, and main memory cabinets of the early computers were known collectively as mainframes. However, these smaller third-generation installations came to be known as mini-computers. Within its limited market, the computer industry boomed throughout the 1960s and into the 1970s. It would seem only logical that the steady growth and the continual downsizing of circuitry created the next category, but that is not what really happened. The microcomputer was not named so because they were even smaller than many computers, but rather because of the vitally important revolutionary integrated circuit contained within. This new type of chip, the microprocessor, was first produced commercially in 1971, and it would become part of the catalyst of the personal computer revolution. The microprocessor was the invention of a CPU on a chip, and this became the foundation for all personal computers, even your smartphone. In 1975, with the help of demand from electronic hobbyists, the microcomputer boom was born. The first mass-produced, commercially successful personal computer contained just the bare essentials for computing. A microprocessor, the CPU, RAM, the memory, and basic input-output capabilities. From this first humble microcomputer, a spark was lit, and the personal computing revolution began. This established the fourth and current generation of electronic computers, but also the first tier of personal computing, the desktop computer. As desktop computing evolved and matured, they developed into consumer devices, and then later into corporate and creative ones. By the early 1980s, customers wanted portability with their computers, so the market answered first with luggables, then with laptops, which are now more commonly known as notebook computers. These are the second tier of personal computers. It would take another decade or so before notebooks could compete with desktops in the realm of performance, and then not until 2008 until notebook computers outsold the desktops. Where once laptops were the limited companion computing devices, even more portable yet more limited handheld computing devices began to appear in the mid to late 1980s. These were the first of a new category, a third tier of personal computing. The third tier would go through many iterations, evolving, then devolving into the organizer category, before arguably becoming firmly established with the release of the iPhone in 2007. It is an ironic truth that it ultimately was not the computer that became a phone, but the phone and PDA evolving into a computer. Now, smartphones are fully realized personal computers and can do just about anything that a desktop or notebook can do only limited by the realities of their screen size. Modern tablet computers started as an extension of the smartphone, but are now essentially a hybrid of both the second and third tier. So where did the Apple Newton fit in? Well, you might have missed it, but its place is just about in the middle of the evolution of handheld computing. It was way ahead of its time in many regards, and it influenced the third tier in numerous ways that most of us don't even realize. well with the Lisa story in a lot of ways. For instance, a lot of people have the misconception that the Newton was a, just a total money failure for Apple, which in essence it was, the sales of the Apple Newton, but the development of the ARM chip and their, and their investment in it, and then ultimately designing their own chips out of it, they made far more money than they lost. Um, there's also another key thing where I point out about the, the fourth generation called, and computers called microcomputers, not because they're, they were smaller, but because they used a microprocessor. And so I'll get back to that. But you know, we're all using microprocessors still, right? And that's what differentiates that last stage or tier. Anyway, <laughs> all right, let's get back to it. Generation, <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for. All right, let's see here. Okay, so um, I tried to start a club again. I, I, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. I moved to Atlanta for 12 years, so the first article I was trying to get one off the ground in Jacksonville. didn't really happen. Moved to the Atlanta area. Ultimately got a club off the ground. There's a number of people here from that club, the Atlanta Historical Computing Society. So 
This is just, um, that was a really cool Altair and a desk I was acquired. That got this club off the ground. And then ultimately, all together, this is the very first one. We got the Vintage Computer Festival Southeast going in the Atlanta area. They just had their ninth show. Again, I don't live there now, so. But there's from the first show. But that's enough about me. So um, before I, I play some of the clips, so two of the main themes I think that flow through the documentary are, uh, and, and a, a lot of people from Bill Atkinson to John Scully and other people, they say this. So the Lisa was, a, was not the prototype of the Macintosh officially, but it was unofficially the prototype Macintosh. And Bill Atkinson, one of the chief engineers, actually worked on the Lisa, and you'll hear some of this talked about in these clips, and then he moved right into the Macintosh project. Um, and then its legacy ties in. So there were precursors uh, to the Lisa. There was the Xerox uh, Alto and the Xerox Star. And even the Xerox Star was a commercial product, right? So, so how can you say the Lisa was the first commercial graphical user interface computer or whatever? Um, but then there's also research before Xerox at the Stanford Research Institute with Douglas Engelbart, if you've ever heard of him. But anyway, so the differentiation there is that the Lisa is a true personal computer. It has a microprocessor, right? It has RAM, it has all the things. The Xerox Star had discrete circuitry. So did the Alto and all, they weren't personal computers in that essence. And they weren't, even though the Star was a commercial product, it really wasn't a direct consumer product. So those are some of the key things that differentiate it. And we're gonna do this at the end. So one more little clip and I'm gonna play the other clips. There's only a minute. Lisa was the first in Apple System 32 family of supermicros that use advanced technology to work the way you do, by sight, instinct. There was once a time when personal computers were less friendly, less intuitive, a time when all commands had to be input from a keyboard. Things that we now all take for granted, like the touchscreen interface of our smartphones or the graphical mouse-driven interface of our personal computers, all evolved from one original foundational computer. The first mainstream, commercially available personal computer with a graphical user interface. The Apple Ma the uh, no, it was the Apple Lisa. The Lisa may have been considered a failure by most, but it was a catalyst for everything we use today. There were important concepts, papers, presentations, developmental systems, and other computing devices which came before it, but Apple's Lisa computer started the revolution. This revolutionary computer is what inspired Steve Jobs to compete with his own company to create a smaller, cheaper Apple Lisa, the Macintosh. This is the story before Macintosh, the Apple Lisa. in the I talked about, you mentioned, you started off with something about an inflection point. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember where you were going with that and stuff? So maybe, oh, yeah, okay, start. start with that. So the, the Lisa is actually a very interesting machine because it... Oh, I'm sorry, interrupt one time. In the film, you're not going to see me or hear me, typically. I, it's possible, but because sometimes I wasn't a professional, not every time, but here I thought it'd be fun that these clips I kind of, you know, they're raw a little bit. So it's like here it starts off with you hearing me. It is at an inflection point in a lot of dimensions. So one is going to be the hardware. Um, at the very base level you see a bunch of machines that started out in, in the light, uh, late 1970s as 8-bit computers. And the Lisa actually has a lot of 8-bit components. If you, if you look at all the I.O. devices that the Lisa has, uh, such as the VIA chips or the SEC, all of those are 8-bit devices that you'll also find in other machines like the Commodore PET or Apple II and things like that. Um, but at the same time, its CPU is a 16-bit CPU on the outside. It has a 16-bit bus. Internally, though, it's a 32-bit CPU. So it's kind of a mix of, of all of these things coming together. On the physical case design uh, aspect of it, it looks a lot like 
one of the Tandy uh, Model 3s or Model 4s. So it's got that classic look where you have a screen to the left and uh, a couple of drives to the right. Um, so it still has some roots in the 70s and yet it's a little bit futuristic as an angle. Um, it's got an interesting keyboard, an interesting mouse which never existed before. And then if you look at the software, that is really, really the big inflection point for everything that is to come afterwards. So before that, you had Xerox Park and you had the Alto and the Star. Um, but with the Lisa, you actually not only do you get Windows and a mouse, you also get icons, you get menus, um, you get a lot of features that don't show up until much, much later, even in, in most recent Mac OS's. Things like soft power buttons, where you tell the machine to turn off and it's controlled by software and it actually cleans up after itself and it remembers where its folders are, what documents you had open, uh, and it puts things away and then when you turn it back on it puts everything back where it was. So you turn it back on, you have your state. And there's a lot of software today that doesn't have that and didn't have that until recent years. If, even if you look at recent Mac OS as far back as five years ago, it didn't have that. right? You still don't have a lot of things that are in the Lisa, such as the document-centric model, where you now have to open an application and not the document itself. Although, if you work with, let's say, the Finder, you can sort of get into that mode where you double-click on the Finder and the document opens up the application, and there's your document. But with the Lisa, it was really more about your document and not about the application itself. We, end users didn't care about apps. That came later. So it kind of became the thing that was left behind. It was a kind of a shameful thing for the developers at some point where they were mistreated. And if you worked on the Lisa project, you weren't part of the cool team. And if you worked on the Mac, you were. But then all those seeds of that technology made themselves available to the Mac and then took off from the Mac and forward. And of course there was some you know, back and forth between the Mac and Lisa team where um, Lisa Graph became quick draw and it got rewritten from Pascal to 68,000 assembly and then made its way back into uh, Lisa OS 3.1 in assembly. So you know, there, there was still some dynamic there between the two, but really what had happened was people forgot about the Lisa and moved on to the Mac. Um, and, you know, obviously there was some competition from Microsoft, although if you look very carefully at the first versions of Windows, like Windows 1.0 and 2.0, not 3 and above, Microsoft didn't copy the Mac, it really copied the Lisa. Alright, session four. Alright, so I'm sitting here in front of uh, two of the pieces of equipment in my collection, my Lisa 2 and an original 128K Macintosh. Both of these systems were for sale in 1984. One looks a little more sophisticated than the other one. One also costs four times as much as the other one, so that's not entirely unexpected. Lisa again introduced the graphical user interface to computing. So this was the desktop, having an office metaphor. You have files, you have folders, you have a trash can to put things away, you have a calculator, etc. You had a mouse with a pointer to select things on screen, and you had menus which gave you the choices of what you could do with the operating system or the documents you were working with. The Macintosh now has a similar thing. You have a smaller screen in this case, but the same idea. Black and white, graphic user interface. Mouse works exactly the same way. Menus to choose what you can do with documents. There was no hard drive in the first Macintosh. There was no hard drive in Macintoshes at all until about four or five years after the product came out. The Macintosh shipped with one floppy disk, if you had enough money, you had two floppies, and you could save your data on one drive without putting it in the other one. If not, you swapped floppies a lot. The Lisa, the Lisa 1 had an external hard drive that sat on top. The Lisa 2 has the hard drive inside, or you can get the drive that sat on top. So it had a hard drive back in 1983 when most people, when hard drives were the size of things that typically went in the cargo sections of airplanes. So much easier to save your work and not have to swap things. The Lisa is interesting in that it uses a metaphor called a document-centric model. Apple played around with this in the Macintosh in the mid-1990s with something called OpenDoc, for those of you who are real geeks and remember this thing. With a document-centric model, you're working on the document as the main 
item and different programs can use it depending on what you need to do. If you need to use a graphic part of it, you need to use a, a uh, word processing part of it, etc. The Macintosh has a program centric model. You run a program and it opens a file and you do things on that file and then you save that file. You're running a program and you create files with the program. So the Lisa uses a document centric model whereas the Macintosh uses a program centric model. On the Lisa you open a doc you, you tear off a sheet of paper from a pad of that type of document and you work on it and the program automatically knows to work on that file. So you tear off a piece of paper from word processing. If I open my Lisa Drive here, double click on it, I go to Lisa Write. Now I don't have an application, I have an application for Lisa Write, but that's not actually what I want to do to start the program. I have a stack of paper here called Lisa Write Paper. And I want to click on the stack of paper and it will create a new piece of paper for me and then open Lisa Write to work on it. Here's my new piece of paper, working at blazing speeds. This was very fast in 1984. Now I'm opening my paper, Lisa Write Paper, with the date on it. Notice it has a name and date. I don't have to assign that. It saves automatically. We lost that for a while, then it came back. The Lisa was ahead of its time. Just a moment, please. It's getting ready. Here's our weight cursor. Nice big hourglass. Okay, and I can type my manuscript. Oops, make typing mistakes. M-A-N-U-S-C-R-I-P-T. Okay, assume that's my best selling novel. I don't need to save this. I just actually double click to close the box. Paper is automatically saved. Again, you're dealing with 1980s time frames here, not 2000s time frames. And there's my Lisa paper torn off the pad of Lisa paper. Now let's see how we do this. So imagine you're, you're just having a casual conversation with someone who isn't particularly technical, right? So, and, and somehow the Apple Lisa comes up. So what what is some what are some things that you maybe you'd want to say to them that most people don't they don't even know about the computer but things you think like well this is why it's a uh, things that people don't know about it you know yeah. why it's significant yeah uh, I think I think you know when talking about the Lisa again people know that it's it was ten thousand dollars and that it was a flop and that you know maybe it was named after Steve Jobs' daughter uh, they don't know that it had a a really pretty high-end, modern, preemptive, multitasking, protected memory operating system that was ahead of its time and that we didn't see on the Mac for it was some of those features, protected memory and, and um, uh, preemptive multitasking, we didn't see for 20 years after the Lisa was a supposed flop, right? And it, it did those things so well. I think another interesting thing about the Lisa that's, you know, maybe a side note, but it ran, it ran Xenix. It ran a version of Unix. Um, in you know that was a third-party product. It was uh, a Microsoft product, if I recall. Um, it was a powerful machine. It was not you know a piece of junk. It was a, it, it was something that you would buy to get real work done on. And um, you know in in many ways the Mac, which came out a year later, was a was a stripped down Lisa, but it was stripped down in in a lot of serious ways, which you know made it made it so it was cheap enough to be successful. Um, it also meant that we lost a lot of what really made the Lisa special. I'll get it. Yeah. And this next question. So this is the what's called the preliminary Macintosh business plan from 12th of July 1981. And this little symbol down here shows a Xerox machine with a strike through on it saying do not copy. But the irony of this symbol is that Johanna Hoffman, who was an a employee at Apple, had been tasked by Steve Jobs to create a business plan for the Lisa and Mac projects for the 80s. Uh, but he wanted it to look like the actual interface that they saw on the Alto. So here's a pull down menu that says Macintosh preliminary plan, Apple product overview, Macintosh market, markets and software ranking, Macintosh organization staffing and budget and open issues. It's a pull down menu. So that's how they're gonna run this business plan document. And if we look into it, we have things like uh, comparing it to other computing systems at the time. The IBM Chess, which was the IBM PC, which was a month in the future in August of 81. And these bands, and 
All of this was laid out on the Bravo X editor on the Alto computer at Xerox Park, which was the only place she could go in the world where she could lay out a document on the screen that had graphical elements and print it on a laser printer. So the very computer that Steve Jobs had seen at the demo at Park, she snuck in to an office after security had left to a friend's office at Park, pulled a disc platter off the top shelf that was hidden, put it in and developed the proprietary 10-year business plan for Apple Computer at a competing company's chief software lab, or, or chief research lab. The largest case of industrial espionage probably in the history of technology. Yeah, so now this is the coolest thing I have. Um, so this is a Lisa One uh, miniature that's been 3D printed by Charles Bangin. And I got into this through Adam Sommerfeld who um, basically wanted to have a working uh, Lisa miniature and there's actually a little Raspberry Pi that's in here. You can see the uh, connectors for over here and you can see a little cable sticking out the back here. And so you can have a Raspberry Pi that uses the one of the widget slots to hold an SD card and uh, boot up uh, Raspberry Pi OS which runs Lisa M and then you would see it on this little tiny display uh, which would have been great if it had a little bit more resolution but you know you can always use the HDMI port instead. Well that ends another episode of the Retro Mac Cast with James and John and until next week remember it's not old. <laughs> it's retro. Do it one more time. <laughs> it's retro. So that was it. So again, this is Ray Archila. I can never say his name right. Last name. Archilian. Thank you. So he he's made the the Lisa emulator, and so I highly recommend it. it it's made for Windows, the Mac, or the Raspberry Pi, and it's free. And you can download it, and you can get a taste of of running a Lisa for yourself. So. Um, yeah, really, really interesting guy here. And uh, so, trying to keep in the time schedule. I hope that was enough and you enjoyed it. Um, so, we're going to do a little quick QA, try to answer some questions. So, we're, we're open. Anybody? And go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> something that uh, has confused me quite a bit about the Apple Lisa, right? It came first, it was Jobs' project. He, uh, you know, w was pushing it through, trying to, uh, you know, make it successful, and it did deliver. Uh, but then, when they went to do the Mac, it's almost like they forgot the Lisa existed. It was just so disconnected uh, from the the Lisa development, at least, you know, from the accounts we hear online from the developers and whatnot. It, it's like it was a brand new thing. What was going on there? Why why was that disconnect? It's like they just pretended like the Lisa no longer existed. trailer, the little teaser trailer, where like Steve Jobs, you know, started. So here's the quick story is that he was the, uh, I don't remember his exact time, he was a co-founder, obviously. But they had brought, you know, he had personally had brought in John Scully, the CEO and president, the adult supervision for Apple Computer, right? And, you know, the Apple II was just selling like bomb, bonfire or whatever. So it was carrying the company, but they had to, they had to plan on the future. And the, the uh, you know, around this time too, the Apple III was a failure. Right, that was trying to be the business computer, but they were kind of leaning into being more like big companies like IBM and HP, where it, a committee-driven, you know, design and you know, the Lisa was a huge project, and so Steve Jobs was like um, the managing director, or you know, I don't know exactly. He, yeah, he was running it, but he was. Well, well, one of the people I interview, not in this short here, John Couch was, was the actual, like, I think he was the managing director or in charge of it. But then, of course, Steve Jobs was overseeing that. But he was just, just a pain in the butt. Like, you know, he's immature and just giving people a hard time. And he basically got booted off the Lisa project. And, uh, and so he almost literally said, well, I'll show them. And, uh, and so, um, what's his name that was running the Mac Macintosh? Oh, uh, um, um, see, I'm, just, I'm ashamed. I can't remember. Uh, um, I thought um, his name, but um, while he's thinking of it, uh, thank you, Jeff, yes, Jeff Raskin. Jeff. 
I'm not getting any younger, you know, I can't throw the names out. <laughs> Uh, so Jeff Raskin had a, had a little utilitarian project that he had gotten permission to start up, a little small project called the Macintosh Project. But his idea was to be a, like a very inexpensive $1,000 computer. It would have a bitmap screen, but it wasn't graphical user interface, much less being uh, mouse driven. Because Jeff Raskin was very much about keeping your hands on the keyboard. And he actually came up with th uh, uh, ideas called leap keys and stuff so you could be more efficient, which Modern interfaces use that, right? Com keyboard equivalents. So basically, Steve Jobs commandeered the Macintosh project and literally decided to make it a cheaper, smaller Lisa. And then he pulled a bunch of people off the Lisa project. And Apple, it was, it was under the radar. And he was a co-founder. <laughs> so he could kind of do what he wanted, and then they're like, oh, good, as long as he's off the Lisa project. No, no, because Jeff Raskin was a, uh, his first job at Apple was he, he wrote the manuals. So he was a, I guess you could say he was a writer. I, I, he was more than that too, but he was, yeah. He wasn't an engineer per se, right? No, I don't think so. He was yeah, a musician and Yeah, they, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of people at Apple, you see they have multi-talented, have yeah. a lot of different roles and things like that. But. And he did not get along with Steve Jobs or appreciate that. <laughs> and he quit, you know. He was the one that took Jobs to Xerox. He, he is. He's one of the ones one that of the recommended trips, yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Next question. Go ahead. Oh, well, he's got, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually a good segue into Xerox because Xerox Park back at that time was like awesome. And there's a lot of folklore wrapped around that when Steve Jobs went down there and, you know, stole all of this stuff. But there was actually a business deal you know, with, with Xerox, um, Park, and Apple. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that. It wasn't that he went down there and Adele Goldberg threw him out. Um, well, she probably did. She probably didn't want to show at the time, but there was a business partnership there. And so a lot of that stuff, you know, was folklore and I was wondering if you could just talk a little about that. So, yeah, there are a lot of things about that. And so I know a lot of the people at Xerox Park, and I'm trying the woman you just mentioned too. I think she, she was one of the people that was like, that was necessarily in favor of it. Yeah, yeah. Where there were other people like, no one's gonna ever see this stuff. And, and they're happy, I'm happy that Apple will come and do something, you know, do something with all this work we've done. But you're right, uh, Apple made a deal with Xerox that they could invest a million dollars in Apple pre-IPO, or what, I think yeah, pre-IPO, uh, you know, to allow them to make two trips and, and get a tour, get the grand tour of the technology, which of course wasn't 100%, I mean, they did a lot of work. So Xerox Park, of course, they licensed the mouse from Douglas Engelbart at the Stanford Research Institute, and he did a lot of foundational work, but they, uh, you know, they invented ethernet and laser printing, and, and, and also there's, there's um, misconceptions that they, they didn't make any money, which they made a lot of money they still. Made a lot. Yeah. yeah, but so, um, yeah, so, so Xerox profited from that. And, and, and a lot of the engineers were happy that, because also here came the team of, from Apple and they were really enthusiastic about what they were showing them and they got it, you know, and that's what, you have anything to add to that? that was, yeah, yeah, and, and, and uh, I mean, it's touched on in the documentary by people, you know, John Scully and, and a, a great number of other people who mentioned, you know, firsthand knowledge of what was going on. Uh, so you could look forward to those clips. But uh, I think, uh, if, if I recall correctly, um, the, one of the original sessions, they went in uh, and they saw a lot of stuff. And then Steve found out he didn't see everything. And, you know, he demanded to go back and, and that's that they saw even more. So, you know, there's, there's the misconception that, yeah, Apple just ripped everything off. But, you know, these were concepts. These were things that may have not been fully formed. And to, to put them into a, a way where people could actually use them, there are some great Polaroids that we have from the Mac development team yeah. where they were just trying to see what a friendly user interface could be like. And we have a lot of those scans. We have some excellent things that I cannot wait to show you that weren't ready today. But uh, th it's really cool to look at. Yeah, they, they even ended up poaching a lot of people from Xerox, you know, working on the Mac. Yep. So, yeah, but it's also a misconception where did they, did they, you know, steal ideas? Like, oh, look how that works. And that would, that makes sense, right? They didn't steal code. They, they completely invented it in-house. And, you know, another thing, too, the Xerox Alto and the Star, even the Star, were complicated. And, and they had a three-button mouse. 
You know, and, and so even the, the simplification of the mouse to one button was significant in trying to simplify it, because this was brand new to people, right? They, people were, you didn't know how to use that kind of stuff. A mouse was foreign. We all think it's, it's normal now, right? Because it's very mature, but... Uh. Oh, sorry, this guy. Oh, okay, sorry to be right to you, yeah. Uh, speaking of code, about two years ago, there was an announcement by I can't remember if it was the Boston Computer Museum, but one of the major computer museums that they had received the source code or a significant amount of source code from Lisa. And I wrote them about every, time, every six months saying, where is it at? And it was always like, oh, we're doing this or we're doing that. And it still hasn't been released. Is there any stat? Do you guys know any status of that? I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some legal precedent or they're just waiting to clear things up or, or something. I mean, it, it seems that we hear those same stories again and again, unfortunately, where, you know, exactly, where, you know, an announcement is made. And I, I think something similar happened with uh, the code for uh, Mac Paint and Mac Write or yeah. something like that, yeah. where it was announced and then like a decade goes by or a period of time goes by. So um, I'll be sure to follow that up. I'm curious now, too. <laughs> Well, actually, I'm the owner of Sapient Technologies. I did all the work with redesigning the boards for the Lisa. And when we did that, we discovered some secrets in the hardware. The Lisa was actually originally created to work with a three-button mouse. Yes, it's in the hardware. It also is capable of doing inverse video for the Xenix, for the Unix, so, but it was never implemented. So, but I mean, not a shameless plug, but if you buy the, the Sapien boards, you can do inverse video with them. What is this? Todd Meyer. Okay. With uh, John Woodall, who's uh, very, very prominent throughout the film, especially in the second part of the film. So the second part of the film is, you know, the first, well, let me say, the first part of the film is, the Apple Lisa at Apple, right? And it's developed and, and it's, it's killed off. And then the second part of the film is you know, the Apple Lisa after Apple. And there's two very prominent people in that part of the film. And uh, first there's Bob Cook at Sunry Marketing, the guy I bought my Lisa from. And then there's John Woodall, who I, I deemed the last Apple dealer, because he really was, and it is, I guess. So yeah, so in the third part of the film, um, that, you know, it's, a, it's going to be more about, you know, the Apple today, the Apple Lisa today, its significance, collectors, it, people upgrading it, is that, so, so what he's talking about comes into it, where they have produced um, new boards to help you get, you know, keep your Lisa alive. And, you know, and that's what this is all about, this whole show, right, right? There's people that want to upgrade them or just restore them or reproduce things about it, reproduce the experience. There's different ways of, of looking at it. Um, had uh, Steve Jobs not created the Macintosh, how do you think the path of Apple would have changed in the Lisa project? And just kind of like, because the, the Macintosh and kind of everything that was created there, uh, it set the groundwork for everything to be created after up to like what we have now with like smartphones and stuff. So if you really think about it, it could have a pretty big impact. Um, so I'm just wondering like what, how you'd think things would change. So we'll wrap it up after this, but um, yeah, that's a very interesting, very complex, who knows, right? But, but um, there's also a lot, there's a lot of mythology about all this stuff. So the real, my real quick answer, and I will let Steve answer too, is, um, you, you know, I think, so without Steve Jobs and without the Macintosh, the Lisa would have failed, like it did, right? And it, it stumbled, but I think, I, th I think they wouldn't abandon that idea. So, so hopefully they would have kept working on it and made it cheaper, smaller Lisa anyway. And right, and streamlined it and cost effective. But without Steve Jobs, I, you know, because he brought a lot to the table as far as taste, right? Even through, especially through the Macintosh, and then he left after that. But, um, but here's a really, another big misconception about, about Steve Jobs, and I like to talk about this. I interviewed John Scully, and John Scully gets a bad rap. John Scully is, un, is, un, is unfairly categorized with two words. He fired Steve Jobs, and he drove Apple into the ground. Right? Then he left. You know, and then Steve Jobs is unfairly categorized as like, you know, genius, asshole. You know, then he, then he left. But, so, uh, I don't, this doesn't directly answer your question, I guess, but, you know, when, when Steve Jobs left, the, or people think, uh, where's I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> 
So Steve Jobs, to all his greatness early on in his career there, and the stuff he made possible driving the Macintosh project, he was actually stalling it. The Macintosh was a failure by 1985, until well into 1986. So in December, I think, of 1986, the Mac Plus came out. Two years, two, almost three years after the original Mac. It was, actually, it was actually what the Mac should have been, the first step in its success. A lot of people don't realize, so the big boardroom thing where John Scully fired Steve Jobs, he didn't fire Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs put John Scully, the guy he hired, the president and CEO of the company, up against the wall in front of the board and demanded everybody, we need to stop selling Apple IIs, we need to stop marketing Apple IIs, we need to focus on this, it's the future. And John Scully, the president and CEO of Apple Computer, said, we can't do that, Steve. The Apple II is carrying this company. And in fact, Macintosh sales did not even equal Apple II sales to 1988. That's how important the Apple II was to Apple. Yeah. And then they kept selling Apple IIs in 1994. So again, it, it wasn't until, and then after, so what, another thing Steve Jobs did not want, and I'm not even a big admirer of him, especially his second coming, right, is he didn't want an open Mac yeah. or color, which happened after he left. John Scully made that possible, right? Yeah, I think that Apple. if, oh, sorry, if no, no, if, if the Macintosh was not a thing, uh, and, and we've seen evidence of prototypes and very cool souped up Apple IIs, I think they would have progressed along that path. I think that yeah, was where Apple was, was making a lot of their money. Uh, you see a lot of these pieces of the 2GS where people are looking at the hardware from certain levels. And the, you know, the Apple 2GS had color and you know, great fidelity sound, sound yeah. way before the Macintosh. So I think, you know, if there was not this Macintosh project, I think you would have seen a, a heavier lean on the Apple II side. Whereas, you know, Jobs was very much against it because he had his own reasons for his own project. He, you know, there, there's that, uh, you know, fictionalized or, you know, sensationalized uh, scene in a lot of these Apple, uh, you know, history documentaries like Pirates of Silicon Valley where it's like Apple team versus Macintosh team and so on and so forth. So I, I think the Apple II would have became a much stronger system and uh, it would have been very interesting to see where that went because that still is a very loved system today. But yeah, maybe the Apple wouldn't have made it, yeah. you know, earlier. They almost didn't make it, right? And then Steve Jobs saved the company and the next step. Yeah, we're, we're all, again, it all traces back to the Lisa, in my opinion, because, but the next step became Mac OS and became your iPhone, and then Android was influenced by it, and we're all using that legacy. <laughs> so, all right, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. And if you have any uh, questions, uh, the, your website is? Oh, thank you, classiccomputing.com. Yeah, so if you have any questions or comments or, or things you want to know about the film, uh, I am Mac84TV on Twitter. I'll be posting some links and stuff uh, with your film soon. I think you another talk, right? Yeah, I'm about to do another talk, well, so I'm, I'm sitting right here. here but. <laughs> but thank you all for very much joining. Really appreciate it.